All right, well, thank you very much. I got into Nodecore. Actually, it was nice. Isaac approached me. Let me back up a little bit more. I was hired by Mozilla to do web UI, of all things. I've been doing web UI for years. But a project I, I was on wrapped up. And I asked my manager if it was OK if I began working on Nodecore. I did. After a little while, Isaac approached me and asked me if I should, or basically told me I should approach Mozilla and tell them, or ask them if I could be sponsored to work on Nodecore full time. And fortunately, Brendan Ike, being the inventor of JavaScript and CTO of Mozilla, was very into it. So that's how I ended up in my position as a Nodecore maintainer working at Mozilla. And one of my obsessions, at least with Node, is performance. And I feel fortunate because the team in Core is very intelligent. And so I can throw out the most insane ideas, and they help me really bring them to a level that's actually manageable and usable. And I am probably the nightmare of every person that came up and just spoke to you about debugging, because I don't care about debugging. <laughs> I really don't, right? It's like, as long as all the tests pass, and it goes faster than it did, in my book, that's a win. So we're going to start talking about what optimizations I've done in Nodecore, because we've received a lot of tickets and uh, people on the mailing list basically asking us, like, what's going on here? Why does it look like this? Hopefully, this will give you some insight into why I have chosen to do things the way I have in Nodecore. So as a preliminary note, all the code I, I'm going to run tonight, all the benchmarks I show you, were run in, on master. And I mean, like, literally, when I was writing this talk at 4.30 yesterday AM, right, I found a performance thing that needed to be fixed uh, with buffer. And if you look at my commit history in Node, I'd say approximately half of all my commits begin with buffer. So it's kind of my little baby right now. So at 4.30 AM, I committed a patch to fix a performance thingy that I found. And then I had to go through and redo all my benchmarks. So also, I think I should, also, I should preface this with, I started programming C++ last November, specifically for the purpose of being able to make Node faster. I've been doing, like I said, web UI. So if you see anything wrong with my C++ syntax, please go easy on me. I'm still learning. Ben is teaching me, and he's being very patient with me, but yeah. So let's discuss a little why co core code is so confusing. First off, it's unintentional. I never set out to actually make things harder for other developers to do. I do it after having done much analysis and benchmarking. And when I say analysis, maybe by a quick show of hands, who here has heard of IR Hydra? Nice, that's like almost no one. IR Hydra basically allows you to run your application, and it generates all the assembly code of all the different performance, in, um, of all the different optimization stages, and it dumps the assembly out along with all the code comments. You load it into IR Hydra and then it will step you through the actual lines of assembly code that were generated by your JavaScript while it was running. That is, in my opinion, by far the most efficient way to truly figure out if your code is going faster between two different, um, between two different changes. Because micro benchmarks are very un, um, un unsafe. They don't tell you near as much as they should. Uh, a lot of times, performance enhancements on micro benchmarks are within margins of error. But as I'll show you tonight, even those tiny performance improvements can mean a lot in Node Core, and that's why we, we have implemented these. So we're going to start with the basics, right? Hoisting our functions. We're going to start with a basic one. That is a little too small. OK, so here I start off with basically a function. I loop through it. I send this prime generator function to process.nextStick, right? And it basically just generates prime numbers up to 
n that I pass to it. Now, this looks like perfectly sane code, but if you don't understand that how process.nextTick -tick works, and if you don't process, don't know, understand how V8 works, this is actually going to lead to a large performance hindrance. By running this, we're going to see that it runs in 19, approximately 19.5 seconds on my machine. But if we hoist the gen prime function out and then use a small closure in process next tick to call out to gen prime, our total runtime is only 4.6 seconds. That's a massive performance difference. And the reason is when you pass a function directly to, uh, like directly in the argument spot in a function, V8 treats that as an anonymous function and will have to re-optimize that every time and so it can never truly fully optimize the the function itself. Process.nextTick is probably um, the most important place not to do that. If you must do it, do it like it's done here and putting a small stub. At least that's what we do in core for that reason. Now, okay. Okay. Anybody who's spoken to me personally, I'm very adamant about this. I hate UTF-8. And I'm going to explain why. First off, I'm not going to show the code here, but on the GitHub page that I will post at the end of this, I have examples and benchmarks for every single slide I've shown you I will show you tonight. So here, we're decoding a string. We've taken a buffer of n bytes or kilobytes, and we're decoding it using these three encodings. Now, if the string is, in fact, UTF-8 in this case, and you use ASCII, you're going to lose data. So we're taking the assumption that your, your string is within ASCII space, right? And as we can see, small strings, no big difference. But as the string grows, you lose massive amounts of performance. It gets even worse, though, if, you, if your strings actually enter into full two- and three-byte character UTF-8 space, right? beyond just the Latin one set. And what that looks like is this. All right, decoding full UTF-8 strings with UTF-8 is insanely slow. So why parse UTF-8 in binary? There is, like, you might wonder why I'd show you this slide. It's like, well, if it's UTF-8, I don't have much option other than a parse it in UTF-8, but you do in some cases, and I'll show you um, a specific case that actually Max gave to me, wherever you're sitting, this is for you. So maybe you want to write out some JSON keys to, I don't know, level to be, right? But you know that your values are in UTF-8, and so you're reading in a massive JSON file into Node, and you need to parse it, and then you need to write out those keys into maybe different databases depending on um, whatever parameters you've set. So first we need to make the assumption that the keys in this JSON file do all fit within the lat Latin 1 space. Do, is anybody confused when I say that? When I say like 1 byte, 2 byte, Latin 1, UTF-8? Everybody okay on that? Okay. So first we're going to set up the scenario by making a tiny little JSON with some UTF-8 characters, right? Then we're going to move on, and what we're going to do is actually take the buffer we created and decode it as a binary string, and then we're going to pass it to json.parse. Now, unfortunately, json.parse does always assume that it's UTF-8, but I'm actually working on a hack for that, so hopefully we can fix that in the future. But now if we console log the output, what, we, like, what the actual is on the right, you can see there are the UTF-8 characters, but on the left, you can see the binary output, right? It looks really funky, but it's, it's going to work out. Let's say now we have to go ahead and write out those values to the level DB database. If you get the new buffer, but right before you pass a string, you actually wrap it in a buffer and give it the binary encoding, it's going to properly decode the bytes. And since level DB has to decode the string to a buffer anyway, we're not losing any performance in that aspect. In fact, we're gaining some because I believe level, D level DB always assumes UTF-8 to begin with, right? So our output, once we've actually gotten the value back 
in this little example, is the correct UTF-8 characters. So we bypass the need to do the full UTF-8 decoding, right? And treat it as binary, but still written it in properly. Now, what does this have to do with Quora? This seems very abstract. I want to give you a solid example to let you see um, why this encoding thing is important. And one important way we use it is with HTTP headers. This is a recent change. Sorry, my mouth is very dry. We've decided to parse all HTTP headers as Latin 1 instead of forcing them into the ASCII space. This actually can save. I mean, when you're handling lots of requests, and once again, we're not writing Node for the 99% of users who are writing um, small prototype-based things that maybe a few people will be using. We, we write core, at least I, my hope, is that we can make Node a proper, super solid enterprise application, right, that people can use with full confidence. All right, so when strings grow, we have, well, okay, so as you create larger and larger strings, you would believe that the creation time of those strings would at least be linear in size, maybe even slightly exponential, but maybe just a little bit, right? What actually happens is this. <laughs> All right? On the left there is milliseconds of creation time of strings. And what happens at right at that point is garbage collector freaks out, and I haven't been able to fully trace down the, the V8 code that causes this yet, but from my analysis, I can see that the V8 garbage collector suddenly has to start reaping a lot more and spends a lot more time in garbage collection, which actually, so this number actually technically isn't the string creation time. It's the string creation time plus full impact on your application because of garbage collection. So we introduce this thing called externalized strings, which basically means we take externalized memory and we tell V8, point directly to it, and treat that external memory like a buffer, right? Something that lives outside the V8 heap. Treat that as a string. Let me hit on a small point. This is another reason why I hate UTF-8. You cannot treat UTF-8 as an externalized string. You always have to copy it into the V8 heap. So what happens to that graph when we use externalized strings? We can see that performance starts to, it's still variant, but it's treated much, much better, right? Now, this is still a not insanely common case because the inflection point right there is right around one meg, but still, like, I, I hated seeing that when, whenever I was benchmarking. And so I'm really happy that even though at around one meg, larger than any network packet or anything we'll be receiving, we were able to level that off. Now, Externalized strings do have one slight side effect, and that is you can mutate them. But in like your normal string, technically is immutable, right? But you can mute an external mutate an externalized string. Uh, here's a quick example of actually doing that. And so at the bottom there, you can't see it super well. I create a buffer, a very large buffer. I create a string from it, and I, I take a subset of that string that I filled with the letter A. And then I use this um, native module that I have scripted at the top to fill it with the letter B, and then I output the string again. And my output has been a mutated string. OK. So a best practice tip, don't mutate your strings. <laughs> it has insanely unknown consequences, especially, and I've only, I've, I'm not even going to attempt to do this because it's not worth my time, but theoretically, you could spin up another thread with libuv and mutate your string at the same time that v8 is trying to access it to do like a regex. And that would just have insanely horrible consequences. And the reason I bring this up is simply because I know some developer out there is going to be digging into core code. He's going to realize that we're using externalized strings. He's going to realize he can use externalized strings. And then he's going to think, hey, I can mutate these strings. I bet I can use it in my application in some way. And then he's just going to confuse the community so, so badly 
using this weird and totally improper technique. All right, so setting object properties from C++, what could be so hard about it, right? You'd think that the V8 API was actually very efficient, but in fact, it's not so much, and it's more difficult than you think. This code is really tiny and hard to read, but here what I'm doing is I'm creating, I'm creating an object in C++, and then I'm setting three object properties on it, Use, and I'm creating a new string every time. That's an implementation detail. Don't need to worry about it. This one, basically the same thing, also has an implementation detail. It's a more optimized case. Just keep that in mind. Here, I'm doing this stupid thing where I actually make an array of the properties I want to set, and then I send those up to JavaScript, and I pass to the new object I've created in C++, and I send that up to JavaScript, and I have JavaScript set the properties on the object. And then the final step is to say, screw it, I'm just going to have JavaScript set all the object, pro I'm, I'm going to have JavaScript create the object and set the object properties. So we're calling in a JavaScript for no other reason other than to create an object instead of just creating it with the C++ API. And a lot of people would think, oh, well, crossing the boundary from C++ into JavaScript is going to be super expensive, and it's going to cost our application a ton. Actually, um, we're going to see that the second case there, create, setting those three object properties from C++, take approximately 800 nanoseconds, where actually sending those properties out to JavaScript to be set only takes 148 nanoseconds. Now, you might be saying, oh, well, I'm only saving like 650 nanoseconds. But remember, for every like connection and request that you're doing, we're doing tons more underneath. And I'm talking on the level of like hundreds and hundreds of thousands of operations per second, potentially in high I.O. scenarios, right? So even in the most optimal C++ case, passing everything out to JavaScript is still 4.5 times faster. And so in Node Core, sometimes what we will do is actually create an array of properties and then throw those, up to, throw those out to JavaScript. And so you might see random functions that seem like they do absolutely nothing and seem very out of place. They might be one of these types that we simply use as a performance enhancement. OK, now another one. And this one is probably, this one is probably among one of the more confusing, right? Is accessing named properties versus index properties in C++. Because remember, we handle all of that low-level stuff for you so you can write your applications in JavaScript and not have to worry about it. So here, I'm just simply accessing um, three, at the very top you can see the object, they're named, length, type, and used, with three different types, uh, a number, a string, and a Boolean, right? And I pass those in, and I access them using the most optimal method in C++. Now, in this one, I actually pass in an object. Don't worry about the implementation detail of actually creating an indexed object instead of using an array. Implementation detail again. And then I access those properties in C++ via the numeric index instead of the name property. All right? Performance difference. 2.6 times faster to access the index properties than it is to access the named properties. Once again, we are doing this up to 100,000 times per second within core. So those nanoseconds are very important to us. Now, sharing state. This is by far the most confusing thing that is happening in Node Core. I actually I came up with this idea when I was extremely sleep, sleep deprived. I shared it with Isaac, and Isaac very graciously said, that sounds interesting. Go ahead and give it a shot. We'll take a look. Right? And even at the time, I thought it was a bit insane. But it actually worked out very well. So this is mainly used in process.nextTech. So if anybody has jumped into source node.js and looked at process.nextTech, process they will see this really strange syntax that is shown right here, which you cannot see super well. Let me zoom in just a little bit so you can see the stuff at the top. Right? And so what you'll see are these like k in tick, index, last thrown. They're all just numerically indexed. But then here at the very bottom of the top box, you'll see 
what is he doing? He, I'm, I'm actually keep manually keeping track of the length of the next tick queue, so I know exactly how long the, the queue is. Now, why don't I just use the array length? Once again, as we've seen, accessing an array pro or accessing a name property, or even accessing an array length from C++ is still very slow. What I'm doing here, and one of the great things about like array buffers or buffers is that it allows JavaScript to write directly to external memory. And then what I can do at the bottom here, which you can't see super well, is I can, re I can create a struct right around that memory and then read from it directly. And so as far as node core is concerned, I've now basically turned what was an expensive operation into a complete no-op compared to the cost of using V8. And what happens is I can, from C++, check and see if any callbacks have been queued before I actually bother calling into the, into the queue processor, into JavaScript. This is a change that happened, I think, three to five months ago, right? And so you would ask, well, how much does this actually save you, right? This is a fairly complex, fairly mind-bending example. Uh, so let's see exactly what it does save us. What we're gonna do is run this benchmark. I actually created a custom build, removing the optimization, and then adding them back in. And I added a counter within process.nextTick to see how often, or the process next tick, uh queue processor, right? It's called tick callback, to see how often it ran with and without the optimization. So without the optimization, under load from this benchmark, it was calling out to JavaScript 100, around a little over 100,000 times a second. When I manually kept track of the length and then told it not to call out to JavaScript when there was no length or like when there was no array to process, it only called out 14,000 times, right? So I'm pushing, saving 100,000 calls out to JavaScript from C++ and crossing that boundary per second simply because of that one little hack. And once again, at that magnitude, at that level, it doing that type of thing is definitely worth it. Now, I am pretty much wrapped up. I just wanted to quickly run through that with you. I am really happy I was able to share this with you today because hopefully we get less requests on the mailing list now, trying, you know, wanting me to explain what's going on. But also, Core does have a reason for the insanity of performance improvements, it does. And with 0.13 coming out, it's going to get possibly more that way. But I want you to remember that we want Node to stay out of your way, right? When you, do, when you run your benchmarks and when you um, use Dtrace, whatever application to analyze what's going on, we want the amount of time in Node Core to be as close to zero as possible so that it just is simply a layer to allow you to invent and explore and do exactly what you love to do. So, if you want to dive into core, please feel free to ask me. I'm on IRC, I check the mailing list, and I'll even be around during the things afterwards. I don't, I'm not hosting or doing any type of workshop, but if you want to come find me and ask me questions, please feel free. So, that's it for me. Thank you very much for having me.